Today we're talking about a redefined habitable zone and what that could mean for the search for extraterrestrial life. We're also chatting with Deep Space Industries advisor Jeff Notkin about the new asteroid mining company. That and other space and UFO news right now on Spacing Out. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Maureen Ellsbury. Thanks for joining us today. As I promised last week, Maureen has returned to us after being out of town for a couple weeks. Maureen, it's great to have you back, partner. Well, it's good to be back. Thanks. All right. Thanks to Amy and uh, Micah for covering for me when I was gone. They, they did all right. <laughs> Wait, let's talk about the International UFO Congress, because I haven't had you here to do that. As you are aware, we're just a couple weeks, basically a couple weeks, about two and a half weeks away. About three. Uh, two Three and weeks. a half yeah. uh, away from this International UFO Congress we've been telling you about. Hopefully you know about it now, but let's talk about it. This is a big event. It is. It, it's, it's really uh, tough to put on. Uh, I'm in stress mode right now, but yes. uh, it's going to be really exciting. We have a lot of really great speakers, um, including a French official uh, that's going to discuss some really cool things in the government going on with basically this report they've done. Uh, the Sigma report that basically said some UFOs they believe are extraterrestrial in yeah. uh, nature. I yeah. mean, it's big stuff. Yeah, he's one really exciting person. There are several people there that we're really excited to see personally. Um, but yeah, 20 plus speakers. So it's filled with speaker presentations from a variety of people, experts in, in various fields, um, government officials, TV personalities. Mm -hmm. And as you saw last week, Ben Hansen from Sci Fi's Factor Fake is going to be there. He's going to be speaking in addition to leading the Skywatch. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the Skywatch. And don't forget, that's a free event. Right. So you can come out and uh, play with all the night vision gear, and that's going to be really fun. But definitely go and check out ufocongress.com. It's got all the information. It's got the schedule. It's got all the speakers and what they're going to be talking on. And you can get tickets at the door but it's a much better deal if you do it now because prices are going to go up. We're actually, yeah, we actually just extended early registration through today. So you can still do that till midnight tonight or so. And if but. you're extremely excited for the conference and you just can't wait, you can buy a UFO Congress t-shirt right I now. In fact, I am sporting the ladies' tank version. That's right. We've got and, various uh, yeah. versions on the <laughs> website right now. You can buy it so you can show up to the event already wearing your t-shirt and be one of the cool people, I guess. Yeah, like me. Yeah, like, <laughs> uh, I guess. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about some of the news stories that have made headlines recently. A mysterious pile of small purple spheres was discovered in the desert in Vail, Arizona, just southeast of Tucson. A discovery that led some to speculate about the possibility of extraterrestrial eggs. Kega 9, Tucson's ABC affiliate, reports that Geraldine Vargas and her husband stumbled upon the pile on Sunday, January 27th while walking in the area. She photographed this random collection of tiny spheres in the middle of nowhere and sent the photos to Kega 9. A reporter visited the site, inspected the spheres, and describes them as gooey marbles that ooze out a water substance when squished. She continued, they roll, they shine, and they're out of this world. The station reportedly received tons of calls after airing their story about the spheres from viewers suggesting the tiny balls are simply water-absorbing jelly balls that are widely available and used for various purposes. These jelly balls, referred to by a variety of names including deco balls, water pearls, and polymer pearls, just to name a few, are made of super absorbent polymers and are routinely used by floral shops to keep plants hydrated. They're also used in diapers to prevent leaks and even sold as children's toys. But if the purple spheres in Arizona are simply super absorbent jelly balls, why are there so many of them? Retailers sell these products in bags containing thousands of beads that, when exposed to water, become squishy jelly balls. And according to weather reports, it rained the day before the spheres were discovered. What exactly super absorbent jelly balls are doing in the middle of nowhere is unknown. And although the purple spheres found in the Arizona desert strongly resemble super absorbent jelly balls, a positive identity cannot be made without further examination, but the station supposedly is getting testing done. Dan Aykroyd's fascination with all things paranormal is well known, and his next big movie might just be about the famous 1961 alleged alien abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Reporter Doug McCash from the Times-Picayune recently interviewed Aykroyd at a New Orleans supermarket where the actor and comedian was signing bottles of his Crystal Head vodka. When McCash asked Aykroyd to describe his next film project, 
he became suddenly opaque. McCash explains, instead of answering directly, he discussed his enthusiasm for a series of UFO sightings and a milestone alien abduction case that took place in New England. From this response, McCash speculated, I'm just letting my imagination run wild here, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a movie about the 1961 Betty and Barney Hill extraterrestrial encounter in the offing. Ackroyd has spoken publicly about UFOs many times in the past. UFO researcher David Sarita produced a 2005 documentary titled Dan Ackroyd Unplugged on UFOs, in which Ackroyd participated in an interview focused almost entirely on his UFO research. In April 2010, Ackroyd appeared among a panel of scientists on Larry King Live to discuss UFOs. When King asked him his beliefs, Ackroyd responded, They are here. Science should accept that they are here, and look how they have come from billion years in the future, or the next dimension, or wherever they are coming from. They have abducted people. With his belief in extraterrestrial abductions and his fascination with the Hill abduction, it wouldn't be too surprising if official confirmation of Ackroyd's involvement in a movie about Betty and Barney Hill comes in the near future. Astronomers at Penn State have redefined the habitable zone, the range around a star that is not too cold or too hot for liquid water to exist on a planet, making it potentially capable of sustaining life as we know it. Building on the previous definition established by Penn State's Dr. James Cassing, the Penn State Department of Geosciences team developed an updated model for determining whether planets fall within a star's habitable zone. And in comparing the new model with the previous model, astronomers found that habitable zones are farther away from the stars than previously thought. Space.com explains the new definition of the habitable zone is based on updated atmospheric databases called HITRAN, High Resolution Transmission Molecular Absorption, and HITEP, High Temperature Spectroscopic Absorption Parameters, which give the absorption parameters of water and carbon dioxide two properties that strongly influence the atmospheres of exoplanets, determining whether those planets could host liquid water. The new definition isn't drastically different from the previous definition, but as astronomer Abel Mendez of the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo explains to Space.com, many of those planets that we believe were inside are now outside. But on the other side, it extends the habitable zone's outer edge, so a few planets that are farther away might fall inside the habitable zone now. Mendez was not part of the team that redefined the habitable zone, but he does manage a list called the Habitable Exoplanet Catalog, which contains all known potentially habitable exoplanets. Adjustments will be made to the catalog based on the redefined habitable zone. And here's another study that could potentially affect the habitable zone. A new study suggests that solar systems in the Milky Way galaxy with stars resembling our sun are more likely to support life than our own solar system. A team of geologists and astronomers at Ohio State University used data from the High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher Spectrometer at the European Southern Observatory in Chile to study eight solar twins of our sun. As the Daily Galaxy explains, these are stars that very closely match the Sun in size, age, and overall composition. The team specifically looked for elements like thorium and uranium, because those are essential to plate tectonics on Earth. According to the Daily Galaxy, plate tectonics helps maintain water on the surface of the Earth. So the existence of plate tectonics is sometimes taken as an indicator of a planet's hospitality to life. Of the eight solar twins studied by the team, seven were found to contain significantly more thorium than our Sun. From this, researchers speculate that the planets orbiting those stars also contain more thorium, suggesting that the interiors of those planets are warmer than the planets in our own solar system. If those planets do in fact have more internal heat than Earth, researchers say this would allow for a longer period of active plate tectonics, which in turn allows for a longer period in which life could develop. Ohio State doctoral student Cayman Unterborn explains, if it turns out that these planets are warmer than we previously thought, then we can effectively increase the size of the habitable zone around these stars by pushing the habitable zone farther from the host star, and consider more of those planets hospitable to microbial life. Unterborn presented the team's findings at the recent American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco. Well, shifting focus from planets and other solar systems to different bodies closer to home, last week we mentioned the new asteroid mining company, Deep Space Industries. Many people are fascinated and curious about this impending industry of asteroid mining. So we've invited our good friend Jeff Notkin to join us today to tell us a bit more about Deep Space Industries and how the company plans to achieve its goals. Jeff, hey, it Jeff. is fantastic to see you again. Hello, Jason. Hello, Maureen. It is always a pleasure to be on my favorite show, Spacing Out. How are you two? Oh, we're wonderful, and I you never. are too kind. <laughs> You know I'm a big fan. I, I do, I do. Well, Jeff, I wanted to have you on a couple weeks ago to talk about Deep Space Industries. And immediately I wanted to talk to you because during the January uh, 22nd press conference the company held to announce its plans, you were actually the uh, MC of the event. So I wanted to talk to you because you were there. 
But then I recently found that you have been invited to be on the uh, board of advisors for the company. Is that right? That is correct. And it's quite an honor. And it's also tremendously exciting. You know me as, as a meteorite specialist, but I'm also a lifelong space program devotee. I have been uh, an enthusiastic proponent of space exploration my whole life. And so there, there's a very happy irony here. I've gone from collecting pieces of space that have fallen to Earth to being involved with this extremely exciting private sector space exploration program, Deep Space Industries. Let's go ahead and jump in and talk a little bit about uh, some of the ideas here that the company has to make this a reality, to mine asteroids. So there, from what I understand, there's going to be a, a fleet of spacecraft launched to basically do reconnaissance work and, and select asteroids to mine, right? Exactly. That's the first step. And the, the first fleet of ships are called Fireflies which will appeal to science fiction fans worldwide, I'm sure. And these are small ships, about 25 kilograms, around 50 to 55 pounds, that will be used to prospect asteroids for resources that can be used. And that's expected to happen in, in as soon as two years, 2015. Wow, wow. We're looking at the first Firefly launches. And then a year after that, the plan is, is to get larger ships out, Dragonflies, and they can actually participate in sample return missions. So bringing part of asteroids back to Earth, which is, is, a, is a dream for meteorite enthusiasts and cosmologists and geologists and astronomers to actually be able to examine in person asteroid pieces that have not journeyed through at the atmosphere and fallen as meteorites, but are actually pristine. And as exciting as all this is, this is really just the beginning. It's not just about sample return missions, it's about prospecting and harvesting materials in space. And as you know, it's tremendously expensive to get anything into orbit, thousands of dollars per pound. And so everything that we need in space, water, fuel, supplies, spacesuits, anything that we need for exploration at the moment has to be blasted up into space at a gigantic expenditure. Imagine if we could build whatever we need in space. And this is one of the big plans for deep space industries. And this, this concept revolves largely around the microgravity foundry, which is in effect a 3D printer that could harvest raw materials from asteroids and then build strong, very detailed, functional metal parts in space. So the short version of this is, imagine if we could send ships into space that could build anything that we need in space for exploration. That's the stuff of science fiction turning into science fact. And that's incredible. That's really going to help with all the colonization plans of all these other companies as well that are launching. Um, but you're talking about all this astronomical expenses. Uh, how is DSI actually planning to make this a reality? We already have investors on board, uh, significant, and we are looking for further investors to help make this project fly without, uh, no pun intended there. And there's some very sensible commercial aspects here. One of the things that has to be flown into space at great expense is fuel for existing satellites. So if deep space industries can produce satellite friendly fuel in space and deliver that fuel to satellites, think of the enormous expense that's going to be saved. So that prospect is very appealing to satellite companies that, that currently have hardware in orbit that need maintenance. Yeah, I like it. There, there's so many exciting aspects to what the company proposes. The microgravity foundry, that's incredible. The, the space gas stations, these are all elements that are going to help not just deep space industries, but space exploration as a whole. So I think that's really exciting. So my question to you is for somebody, say myself, is interested in contributing to the efforts of deep space industries, how would one go about doing that? 
I would start by by visiting our website or connecting with us on Facebook or Twitter. We're we're very active in social media, and I should I should mention that the founder and chairman of Deep Space Industries is Rick Tumlinson, and he is a great mover and shaker in in the space program and space exploration and has been for decades and has been an advisor to presidents and his he was he was listed as one of the most the 100 most influential people in the space program so anyone who is seriously interested in becoming part of this amazing adventure in outer space would be most welcome to contact us through the website or our social media and we'll make it happen awesome well i'm really excited to see what what happens in the the growth of this project um, also, I want to mention that we are going to be seeing you here in a couple weeks. That's right. Um, so anybody in Tempe can come out to Geeks Night Out, and that's on Thursday, February 21st, I believe. And you're going to be out there as well as, um, I believe, something to do with NASA as well. It's what I heard. No? Did I hear that wrong? There's a terrific lineup of uh, science fiction enthusiasts, space enthusiasts, geeks as we call them, with uh, all due love and affection. And I will be one of the guests, and we will be bringing a meteorite display. We'll also be bringing the famous meteorite men truck, the mule, which was seen on all three seasons of my TV series, and that'll be displayed. There is also going to be a replica of the Ghostbusters vehicle. So we're, we're going to put the meteorite men truck next to the Ghostbusters <laughs> vehicle. I, I like it. I like it already. But it's going to be a great, a great event. And, and compliments to the city of Tempe for, for having the interest and enthusiasm and sense of humor to put on an event like this on the steps of City Hall. That, that's great. And it's really nice to see local government supporting science in a fun and engaging way. That's why I want to be part of it. And especially when I found out that you two are going to be there, we're, we're going to try and get set up close to each other, and uh, it's it's going to be a fun evening. Thursday, the 21st, yep. City of Tempe. Well, I don't know. If you're going to have your truck there and there's going to be the uh, Ghostbusters car, I think we might have to bring our production truck to show off, too. I don't know. We don't <laughs> want to feel left out. Oh, I think you should. The, uh, the more interesting vehicles we have, the better. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a convoy. Yeah, that sounds great. A little parade. <laughs> we'll make it happen. All right, Jeff, thanks so much. This has been a lot of fun. We will see you in uh, about a week. I really look forward to it. And as always, thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate All it. Right, Jeff. Right. Thanks, thanks a lot. Jeff. Well, those are the stories for today. Be sure to visit openminds.tv for all the latest news. We always look forward to your feedback, so make sure to leave your comments below on the video on YouTube. And you can always email us at contact at openminds.tv. If you enjoy the show, make sure to subscribe. That way you'll be the first to know when we publish a new episode. Thanks for watching. I'm Maureen Ellsbury. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future.